And we are back on the Zero Hour. I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Etzkow. And I always look forward to talking to my next guest. It's been a while. He's a great journalist. I follow his work uh, closely, and you should too. And he's been writing a lot about uh, one of my favorite, which is to say least favorite subjects, which is Big Pharma. Uh, so I really want to talk to him about that. Alexander Zaychik, and I'll spell that for you so you can find him. It's Z-A-I-T-C-H-I-K. Alexander Zaychik is the author of a recent article in uh, New York Magazine's Intelligencer section entitled, This is How Big Pharma Wins. He is also the author of a new book uh, entitled, Owning the Sun, a people's history. Let me get this exactly right. A people's history of mo monopoly medicine from aspirin to COVID-19 vaccines. And he joins us now. So first of all, Alex Seitchik, thanks for coming back on the program. Always good to be here. So uh, let's start with the article. Uh, this just came out February 21st. This is how Big Pharma wins. A subhead two years into the pandemic, the industry has evaded reforms. A super majority of voters wants. Um, tell us about it a little bit. Let's just start with an overview. Well, the piece attempts to explain why the reforms that are currently in the infrastructure package, which is stalled out in the Senate, which we all know, why those reforms have not happened yet. Never mind the last couple of years since the introduction of a bill called HR3 uh, in 2019. But for decades, we have had large majorities of cross-partisan support for basic reforms, including government negotiating power, um, caps on essential drugs like uh, insulin, which many Americans cannot afford and are rationing and dying as a result. Very sort of fundamental um, government protecting the public uh, responsibilities that have not been taken up uh, or enforced, despite some polls showing 90 plus percent of Americans backing these uh, reforms, which is just without analog anywhere else in the political landscape. You'd be very hard pressed to find any issue that comes close to these numbers. And the Democrats have not been able to bring them over the line. And you'd think even the Republicans would want to bring them over the line. Donald Trump himself was saying he was going to get it done. He was calling the, the drug companies getting away with murder on the campaign trail. Um, hasn't happened. So why is that? And the New York piece tried to get into the gritty uh, of that question. And you have to begin with the patent system, which has bestowed upon the industry a carve out for monopoly in the economy, which is generally considered uh, you know, not a good thing. We have antitrust laws in this country. The patent uh, is, a, is a legal sanction on monopoly in a rare instance of that. And on uh, drugs and medicines, they are a very dubious sanction on monopoly, especially when you get into the large amount of government money that is behind most of these um, medicines that are priced so outrageously. Um, so that's where it starts. And then from there, it becomes a story of industry protecting that monopoly power. And how do they protect that power against efforts to rein it in and control it in the public interest? And there, it's it's sort of a classic lobbying story, um, but a supercharged lobbying story because they have so much money due to these monopolies that they have been able to flood the system. And they've been doing it for a long time and they do it more effectively than any other industry probably. They've been doing it the longest with the most resources. And, you know, we can get into some of that um, if you want, but basically they have evolved into a extremely ruthless, extremely efficient um, lobbying operation with deep talons in both parties, including the Democrats, despite them moving the ball forward farther than it's ever been in terms of government negotiating power with the current uh, reforms in the infrastructure bill. You know, Alex, sometimes I was thinking as you were talking that there's government corruption, there's bad government corruption, there's really bad government corruption, and then there's pharma. It's in, in a class of its own almost. And it, it, it seems to me that your book, Owning the Sun, addresses this as well as your article. Ooh. 
But I think it starts with uh, perception. And I think that's one of the things, especially in your book, you go after. We've somehow collectively accepted an idea that was uh, that was not a given, uh, you know, some decades ago, which is that certain ideas, even life-saving ideas, even ideas that were uh, discovered, principles, facts that were d- discovered, uh, solutions that were discovered by uh, public, the public acting through its government, that those should be owned privately. And that maybe one, it seems to me that one of the reasons maybe they've been able to get away with all this politically is because we're all accepting a flawed premise. Do you get what I'm driving at? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you said at the beginning of your question was that it was something that that was not um, obvious that this should be allowed to happen. It It was actually much stronger than that. Until the early 20th century, it was a deep cultural taboo across the planet, including in the United States. There were fierce debates within the American Medical Association, Medical Association within the pharmaceutical trade groups, what were more, um, not really trade groups then, but were more like, um, you know, guild associations. Uh, there were fierce debates about whether this should be allowed to happen because you could not even prescribe a drug that was under patent for a long time in this country until the early 20th century. It was considered... Uh, the term was growing fat off human misery. It, it would get you cast out of the pharmaceutical and medical establishments, um, which considered themselves profoundly ethical and committed to an idea of knowledge as something that was to benefit all of mankind, in particular medical scientific knowledge, because for a long time, there just wasn't a lot of effective medicines. And if you came up with something that actually reduced suffering and extended life, the idea that you would try to restrict that for private gain was just so outrageous um, that you couldn't get away with it. Your patent would be ignored. You would be cast out of professional societies. You would be treated to absolutely excoriating abuse in the journals, in in public media. Um, I mean, it was really a different world. And it was only in the last century that, that we lost that and have transitioned into this new status quo where, of course, people are trying to privatize um, breakthroughs, regardless of of who funds them and and how many people contributed to those breakthroughs. Um, And it's very recent. And that's what I think is so interesting about this story that I tried to tell. And what I was constantly fascinated by doing the research is just how new this all is. And we could sort of grow up with it thinking that it's always been this way, but it really hasn't. And by revisiting those ethical debates, um, I think it, it helps us sort of understand um, exactly how large the failure has been that we have not brought these um, companies under control as they've continued to just jack up the prices in the U.S. market where there's no countervailing power. So it's only in recent decades that To Serve Man became a cookbook. The um, the uh, It is a fascinating aspect of your book. And again, the book is Owning the Sun by Alexander Zajcik. You have in the beginning, Alex, a quote from the final report of the attorney general to the president of government and practices and, and policies. This is 1947. So within living memory of a fair number of, a uh, small number of a fair percentage of the population. Uh, and it's, I won't read the whole thing, but it says inventions financed with public funds should inure to the benefit of the public and should not become a purely private monopoly under which public finance technology can be suppressed, so on, so on. Uh, they represent, a, these discoveries represent a vast natural resource, uh, and so on. Uh, we must, and then it concludes, the goal is to, quote, spread the benefits of the scientific advances as widely as possible. Um, that's 1947. That's what, 70 years ago. Or some, well, well, I've got my math wrong, but you get the did 70 something years ago so uh what happened how did that change over the course of these decades that's a great question and a, and a big one and it took me a couple hundred pages to tell it right. um but yeah that statement that you read that report was was commissioned under roosevelt and published under truman was the classic statement of this new deal vision for 
government financed research, which was, you know, existed before uh, World War II, but World War II is really what turned it into a Leviathan. That's where we get this modern NIH system, which is just, you know, pumping out billions of dollars to, to labs across the country and, and funding all kinds of research, um, you know, from weapons to uh, medical science. And that vision held its own for a long time. Um, it was embodied by people like Harley Kilgore of West Virginia. Uh, and then when he died, it was taken up by Estes Keith Alver. And then when he died, Nelson Gaylord and Ed Kennedy and down on through today, guys like um, Lloyd Doggett of Texas. Uh, right. But it was beat out basically by the industry. And it's mostly at first Republican allies. And then uh, the Democratic Party was increasingly increasingly subsumed um, by the industry um, program. And the New Deal vision now reads quaint and anachronistic, even though it still sounds as reasonable and humane uh, as it did then. And there's no reason why it can't be taken back up. And there are signs of that happening, which we can talk about. Um, there are signs within the party of change, but nothing quite as robust or as really muscularly liberal as that statement from 1947, which was sort of when it crested. And, you know, you had the other high water mark, if we want to call it that, and it's not nearly as high as in 1947, but the other significant event, which you write about in the book, is uh, the Bayh-Dole uh, uh, to me, anyway, is the Bayh-Dole Act of uh, 1980, is it? Um, and the Bayh-Dole Act says, while it doesn't reverse this tide of uh, monopolization and patent monopolies and so on, it uh, it does say that when a drug is being made uh, hard to access by the public, by the people who need it, that the government has marching rights to step in, march in, and... Uh, take action to make it acceptable. And that, to me, while it's not the vision of 1947, it, it, it gives the government rights, but they've never been used. And this was bipartisan. This was uh, Birch by the, a Democrat, and Robert Dole, a Republican. This was their bill. So how does that fit into all of this? Yeah, the march in rights uh, and the public obligation, the public responsibility language uh, in by Dole was basically a sop to liberals to give them cover to vote for by Dole okay. because then they could say, well, look, if it ever does, you know, become that this law is against the public interest, the government will just assume its power and, and, and reverse the situation never happened and was never intended to happen by okay. and Dole have both published articles saying that was never the intent. Don't even try to impose price controls or reasonable pricing um, policies on the law retroactively. It was a ruse uh, and it was an effective ruse. The other effective ruse of that bill was saying, was originally titling it the University and uh, Small Businesses Patent Reform Act, basically saying only universities and small businesses would um, have access to this public science and they're the good guys. So you don't have to worry about big pharma. But in fact, everyone in that world understood that what was really going to happen was the university patent offices and the small businesses would flip the science to the pharmas. So they just added a step and two, it, the law would just be expanded to include the pharma, uh, the big pharma companies eventually, which is what Reagan did two years later. So the whole thing was um, a charade by Dole, all of the public interest language and by Dole was always uh, an industry ploy, and it was incredibly embarrassingly effective from the point of view of um, Democrats who should have known better and never should have voted for it. So it gave Democrats political cover to vote for this basically giveaway to industry. Um, does it, as this is moving forward in time a little bit, but just out of my own curiosity, Alex, does it still, uh, the fact that it was a ploy and never intended to use, uh, could the president nevertheless uh, or the administration decide to use it anyway, that to say, well, this is our read of the law. And so we're going to do March. And we had a segment with David Day and last week of the American mm. prospect about, about Xtandi. Yeah. There right. you go. That's a perfect use case. And it is absolutely possible if, if the Biden administration wanted to 
enforce its margin power in the, in the case of Xtandi. There's no reason it couldn't. It could also cite um, 1498, a piece of US code dating to the early 20th century. There are all sorts of levers of power. I mean, the US government is a sovereign power. The patent system is under its control. <laughs> it can, uh, you know, it, it, look what it does with eminent domain. There's no reason why intellectual property, which the drug companies are constantly saying is the same as physical property, can't be treated as any uh, piece of physical property. Um, it's just a question of will. Uh, I don't think there would be any public outcry if the government stepped in to make Xtandi and a lot of other drugs that the government funded, uh, in this case, the, the US military, no less, um, available at a, at a reasonable price for Americans. Yeah, it's extraordinary. And I want to go back to, uh, uh, again, the, the the question of this this sort of devolution of our understanding of where drugs and the knowledge behind them, uh, where the ownership, whether they should be owned at all, and if so, by who. It seems to me uh, that uh, the the public support that you described for doing something about drugs is also in a class by its own. You know, we fight for a lot of issues on the progressive side of the spectrum that are popular. Uh, and we make a point of saying they're popular. The X issue has 69% of public support or 59%. We're talking about 80, 90%. And yet, uh, now you talked about in your piece uh, for New York Magazine, you said that, uh, you know, HR3, that's the law to control drug prices. Uh, they called it the Elijah Cummings Lower Drug Cost Now Act, uh, that it was no trifle. And I guess I would agree with you that it's no trifle. But to me, it was a very moderate uh first step toward addressing runaway drug costs and yet because it, it it limited the number of drugs whose prices could be negotiated uh for medicare and so on and yet it didn't pass so i guess two-part question one do you agree with my my interpretation that it was quite moderate modest in its ambitions really and to uh, you know, why the hell couldn't they pass this damn thing? Yeah, absolutely. It was moderate. It was a, it was a compromise. Um, it settled on 50, up to 50 drugs of the 250 most expensive Medicare drugs. Um, that, you know, probably should have been 250 of the 250 most expensive drugs like it is in every other country, uh, where governments negotiate the price of drugs. The idea of self-limiting to that number you know, was a, was a huge compromise. So yeah, it was a moderate bill. And the fact that it looked so, um, <laughs> you know, it looked so wonderful and groundbreaking is it just a testament to how far behind the line that we really are. You just have to look at it relatively speaking. And compared to HR3, what we, we have now in the stalled Build Back Better um, tome is, is even more of a moderate compromise to the point where you can barely even see it. Um, be that as it may, it is a result of the fact that the Democrats had some very influential industry allies, Kurt Schrader um, among them in the House, and then no margin of error in the Senate, where you have some familiar right. names allied with industry. Um, you know, Kristen Sinema is getting a lot of attention for, for good reason, but also guys like Bob Menendez, um, you know, New Jersey, of course, both senators are. are very um, protective of, of industry's interests. And yet um, Bob Mendes seemed so incorruptible to me. That's a joke. Um, please yeah. continue. Yeah. Yeah. So here we are. Um, and uh, the Republicans, if they regain power of the Senate, and then it's just dead on arrival again because they're united um, against uh, any government uh, negotiating power, which is, which is strange if it's still Trump's party because uh, Trump talked about this quite a bit, um, and of course, completely abandoned it um, when when you know it hit the fan. But uh, he did talk about it, and I spent a lot of time in those rallies, and that was one of his biggest applause lines. You know, he would talk about the drug companies, and and that support that you mentioned, that eighty up to ninety percent support across the board, reflects the fact that 
illness and so, <laughs> getting sick is, is a very democratic thing. Uh, it affects right. everybody. And the price of these drugs is so high. It also affects everybody in every class. I was speaking to a guy the other day who founded a major intellectual property law clinic at a huge private university. I mean, this guy was this is a very wealthy man. And he was complaining to me about the price of some of the drugs he has to take. He's, he's an older guy and uh, you know he can afford them, but it's still an outrage. And, and even if you're pretty well off, you're gonna be um, touched by these prices. Um, so I think those two things sort of account for the, the huge support. This isn't something that is just hitting people on, you know, tiny budgets who, who don't have Medicare. This is, this is across the board, uh, an outrage for, for American citizens, anyone who pays taxes and who thinks the government should be looking out for their interests, if only at the level of basic survival and, and, you know, prescription drugs that, that alleviate daily, daily pain and suffering. You know, I just, uh, you know, brief personal note, Alex Zychek, and again, the book is Owning the Sun. I, I have what might be called the precondition for a serious condition that might never develop. It might, but I actually, my whole, to the extent that I do financial planning, it has to be built around the possibility that I might at some any day or never have to start spending fifteen twenty thousand $20,000 a year on uh, drugs uh, to keep my stuff alive. And, you know, the thought goes through a person's mind in that situation. Well, maybe I should die for the financial security of my family and not, you know, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars that, you know, we, we don't have in the bank necessarily before I go or force others to work to, you know, keep me alive or whatever. And I talk to other people about that and they're, yeah, that sucks. You know, I, I, I got a similar situation or whatever. And yet, at no point do we, and I only bring up my situation because it's not because it's atypical, but because it's very typical. And um, people just, on the one hand, they go, yeah, that's horrible. On the other hand, it's like, oh, well, but that's kind of how the world works. And it's shitty when you get, whoops, now Troy's going to have to edit the, the it's bad when you you get on the wrong end of it. But uh, what are you going to do? You know, this kind of what are you, New York, what are you going to do? Attitude about it. And I'm wondering how we break through that. Yeah, well, I mean, the numbers suggest that we have broken through to a large um, extent. Not enough, but I mean, there's, there's increasing organizing going on around the country around this. The anger is there to be harnessed, which is very important. Um, and uh, yeah, I think. I think the breaking through is, is, is the least of it. It's more breaking the grip on mm. on the Democrats. Um, the people have been broken through to, I think, as much as is is needed. Although I don't d discount that you you know in, to meet people who sort of poo poo things, and, and I talk to them too, who think this is just how it is. And that's another thing I tried to do with the book is to make people understand this is not just how it is, and this right. is relatively recent and unique to the United States. Um, <sighs> But uh, so, yeah, it's 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 kind of mind boggling when you when you really yeah. So let's pivot, Alex. I check to uh, to why we can't get something done about this. To me, no matter how much people support an idea, and in this case, the idea, of course, being to do something significant about drug prices in this country. Ideally, we would, you know, and your book is a great tool for this, we would rethink our whole idea about owning drug patents and that sort of thing. And, and I think we're moving in that direction, but I think your book contributes to that. But uh, in terms of the political logjam, it seems to me nothing's going to happen unless politicians pay a price. Right now, it's like everybody wants me to control. I'm in Congress. Everybody wants me to control drugs. But on the other hand, the lobbyists are in my office, they write checks, uh, they pressure me, and I don't see anybody saying I'll lose my reelection if I don't do something about it. And, of course, the Republicans aren't going to oppose them because they're nowhere on this issue. And it seems to me the Democratic Party left is not going to go into... Uh, you know, pick a, a representative who's bad on this issue. There are lots of them. Not going to go into anybody's district 
and say, we're going to primary you because you won't do anything about drug prices. Is that, is that a fair description of what's going on here? Yeah, I think there are signs of uh, change within the party. And one good example of that is Carolyn Maloney, who came out with a very um, strong critique, investigatory critique of the uh, drug patents and the pharmaceutical industry that was started by Elijah Cummings. And when he died, she took it up. And you can have, pro- I, you know, I have problems with Carolyn Maloney and a lot of things, but on this, she has pivoted to positions that gen- used to be uh, unique to the progressive caucus and the sort of fringe. And that is increasingly becoming the mainstream. And you've even got guys like Andy Kim in New Jersey who are not afraid of being uh, primary in the industry's home state sort of standing up and you're seeing a lot more of that, which is important. And while these people stand up, I think it's important to just pound home in public education, uh, in, in information campaigns, how obscene the system is that anyone is defending of either party. I mean, you've got these companies producing margins associated with like luxury handbags during a pandemic on publicly funded life-saving essential medicines. I, I mean, when you really just paint the picture as it is, you don't even have to, <laughs> uh, you know, lean into it. You just stick with the facts. It, it is incredibly compelling politics. And the more people understand exactly how obscene this is, the more courage I think you're going to have um, where you need it and the less impact these industry campaigns and primary threats um, will be, especially the the patient group stuff that I talk about in the piece, the New York piece, where they basically hire very sick people to go on local airwaves to say, if this crazy uh, progressive passes these laws against the industry, then we're not going to be able to produce medicines for my illness and my kid's illness. And we're going to go back to the stone age, basically. And that is... Nobody wants those ads running against them. Um, But if we remove the mask from that argument, which is increasingly happening, thanks to reports like the Maloney report that just came up, um, where they're detailing exactly how far from the truth that is. um, And people intuitively understand that because a lot of the drugs that are priced so high have nothing to do with new innovations. They're they're ancient drugs, often on their second or third monopoly. Um, They've been evergreened. And that's really the business model now. That's how they're making all this money. They're evergreening old drugs. They're not producing new drugs. Um, and we just need to keep talking about that and just don't stop. And I'll tell you, you know, if when you become a patient in, in any way in this process, and I'm already costing uh, the United States government a lot of money in that regard, you discover an entire world you didn't know existed of nurses who call you and explain to you why this drug is this and this and that. They don't just tell you like how to inject something or what. There's a whole, not only is there a lobbying industry and a communications industry, there's actually a patient facing machine, industrial machine, which among other things tells me just how much money is being made here, that they can call so much, that they can send, have video chats and, you know, you name it. And to me, that's, and if they were beneficial, great, but they're not beneficial. They're like marketing exercises. So uh, that to me is a whole dimension of this. And 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 Alex, I check, I can't let you go without mentioning what I consider to be the role of the media and all this. Mm -hmm. It seemed, It seems to me the American media take all of this for granted, that all of the the sort of warped value system that uh, only exists here is taken as a given by the mainstream media. It seems that they don't, there there are exceptions, but they don't tend to cover, you know, the political forces behind all of this. They're reluctant to expose these astroturf uh, patient groups and that type of thing. I mean, nobody wants to necessarily look like they're attacking sick people, right? So it seems to me that there's a major, that the political inaction in, to a certain extent is being enabled by media uh, inability to cover this issue 
well. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, and it's it's worth mentioning that 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 media extends from you know cable news, so called liberal cable news. I try to avoid it, but when I do f- find myself exposed to MSNBC, it's it's mostly pharma ads. I mean, that seems to be one of their major sponsor industries all the way down to the medical journals which has been one of pharma's primary levers of power for a long time where they basically have um entwined their interest with um the medical journals and and, and medical associations in terms of um ad money which buys uh, a lot more um leeway with things like not providing full um trial data and uh, you know, a lot of these medical journal articles are just jokes. John Abramson has an amazing new book out called Sick about that deals with this in some depth. Um, and yeah, so that when you say the media, I, I, I sort of go all the way down to the most sort of arcane medical journal you can think of, which has a lot of influence in ways that aren't necessarily obvious, but are arguably as important as, as whatever Rachel Maddow was not talking about because her ads are all Pfizer. Right, absolutely. And, and you know, Dr. Marsha Angel, uh, who edited the New England Journal of Medicine for 25 years, said she doesn't trust any study published in a journal that was financed by a uh, drug company. She just doesn't trust. She made that blanket statement afterwards that she just doesn't trust them. So you get these. And sometimes, if, as I know you have done, if you look at these studies as well, uh, symptoms alleviated in the placebo group in 32% of people and alleviated in the drug using group by 34% of people, which is in the margin of error. And suddenly millions or billions of dollars are being spent on that drug based on that uh, debatable margin of error, right? Yeah. Yep. And even if it's not a debatable margin of error, um, it may not be a, a a valuable therapeutic benefit. It may be just a benefit that's being reproduced that was already available with other drugs, but Absolutely. it's a, it's a new monopoly. That's what matters to the companies, not whether it's a new therapeutic benefit. Absolutely. So Alex, I check before I let you go, is there anything else you'd like the audience to know about your new book? Um, uh, I would say it has a couple COVID chapters, so it's not just a history. Um, although it is a history of the, um, patent system it goes back uh, to Elizabethan England, but it does have a few chapters um, of th- about the COVID era and the um, mRNA business in which Moderna, I think, is expected to clear about 20, they reported about $20 billion in revenue in 2021, um, selling a drug that was basically financed by uh, the NIH from the beginning. It's on, and there's so much more we could talk about the NIH officials' own conflict of interest on some of these drugs. Yeah. And certainly with the COVID, you know, you, you point out in, in the book that remarkably drug companies' popularities, popularity actually rose in surveys, which again, I think the media could that. So there's sorts of the only thing to do. Uh, for, you know, for my friend Alex Zajic is to recommend that people read this book. The book, again, first of all, the article is in uh, New York uh, Magazine Intelligencer and is headlined, This is How Big Pharma Wins. The book is Owning the Sun, great title, subtitled The People's History of Mon- Monopoly Medicine from Aspirin to COVID-19 Vaccines. So, Alex, thanks. Great work in writing this stuff. And thanks for coming on the program. Thank you, RJ. Always a pleasure. Same here. And we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and you're listening to The Zero Hour.